I'll start. Welcome. Thank okay. you for being here. Uh, I'm Mona Vies, uh, and many of you had emailed me about today's presentation. And we have Julie Reskin, who's our executive director, and Jose Torres Vega, who's our IT manager. So uh, I know most of you are familiar with uh, Medicaid and long term. Uh, services and support. So I'm going to briefly go over uh, who we are as an organization, and then uh, we'll quickly go through the Medicaid, uh, through basics, one part of basics of Medicaid, and then Julie will cover waivers and the current assessment process and the upcoming changes. So Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, or CCDC, has been around since 1990, or actually a little bit before. It wasn't until the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed that we, um, or CCDC, really became more active um, as an organization. And it was really to make sure that all organizations and all uh, businesses throughout Colorado were in compliance with the new law. As CCDC evolved and grew, it became more of a social justice organization. And for people with all types of disabilities of all ages, that would include both seen and unseen disabilities. And so today, some of the social justice issues we work on are housing, transportation, voter engagement, income, uh, income security, and employment. And uh, sometimes uh, we, when there's violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act, then uh, we sometimes have to go through uh, litigation. And we also uh, advocate for Medicaid-friendly le uh, legislative policies. We are a statewide member organization and membership with us is free. And so if anyone, so, you know, people are interested in joining, learning more, they can follow us on social media, um, they can uh, sign up to receive our newsletter, and we have activities there. They, um, and then we have also some other uh, subcommittees that they can get involved in. And I'll be talking more about those later on in the presentation. And that's another piece. The changes that are coming up are so big, they affect, they will impact everyone in Colorado. And for that reason, we have created a statewide steering committee that is, uh, that's made up of leaders from all over the state working in uh, working with people with disabilities. And so that's why we're going around the state to make sure that everyone is informed, everyone knows what's happening. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a process that's, um, in, that's inclusive. And so that's a little bit about CCDC. Uh, one more thing about CCDC, we partner with organizations throughout the state as well. Um, independent living centers, uh, other organizations with like-minded um, social justice issues. Uh, we even have something called One Strong Voice, which we meet every uh, the first and third Friday for an hour and a half and it's all individuals from many different organizations and walks of life uh, working towards um, better lives for people with disabilities. So 
why don't I get 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 into the meat of the presentation yes. now? Um, I know that the people here are familiar with Medicaid and that you know that there are different ways to get into Medicaid for people with disabilities. There's the adult buy-in program, which is available for people with IODD only in the SLS waiver right now. It'll be in the comprehensive waiver at another year and a half or so. Um, and, um, and then there's the regular home and community-based services program. We're, we're also gonna, you know, there's two sides of Medicaid. There's the long-term services and supports, which is home and community-based services and, and institutional services. And then there's the regular Medicaid, which is the insurance, you know, more like regular insurance, which is healthcare, you know, like doctors, hospitals, it includes mental health, transportation and dental. We're only gonna be talking about the HCBS today, the home and community-based services. It sounds like, again, most of you are familiar or all of you are familiar with these LTSS, which, which help people with disabilities of all ages. They can be physical, supervision, queuing, other support. Um, it's also important to note that people don't have to be housed to receive um, LTSS. And I think you all know that people have to get reassessed annually. And I'm, if I'm missing anything or going too fast, just let me know. But I believe that you're all familiar with this. So that's why I'm kind of speeding through it. Um, I, I'm not going to go, go over all of the waiver programs because it sounds like you're all familiar with the waiver programs. Um, and again, if, if there's something that isn't making sense, feel free to stop me. So, like Mona said, um, they are working on changing how people are assessed for long-term services and supports, as well as how the allocations are going to go, figuring out pretty much who gets what and how much. And, the, and so our job is to make sure that people understand how it works. And we also want to create really an army of advocates to help, help make sure that people don't get hurt in this process. Um, I believe, Sue, you said you've been around for a number of years, so you were around then when the CIS rolled out, and probably remember what a fiasco that was and still is. This whole process got started because a number of us went to the legislature and said the CIS is a disaster, it doesn't work, there are all kinds of problems with how it's done. And, and so the state determined, so it was determined is that they needed to have one tool for all waivers, um, and that we needed to learn from the horrific mistakes of the CIS and make sure that we don't repeat those. So for those who weren't around during that, you're lucky. Um, it, was, it was not pretty. And, and so, but, but one of the things that didn't happen when we did the CIS was, was having really people understand what was happening. So there was a lot of chaos and surprise, I think both on the part of case managers and families. So um, one of the things that's important, because again, when the, the CIS came out, a lot of people lost services and some with really tragic consequences. The purpose of these changes is not to cut services or benefits. It's, it's actually to improve outcomes and, and increase equity. Because right now, the way the system works is if you know what you're doing or you have good advocacy, you can pretty much get your needs met. But if you don't, chances of getting your needs met are, are a lot slower. And that's a really unequitable way to work and not appropriate for government program. So this is a way to have more uniformity so that you, if you're in Pueblo and you have a similar set of needs to someone in Durango, you're gonna get the same type of allocation. Now, service availability might still mean that things are inequitable. Um, the, you know, the more rural you get, the less availability there is in many cases. That's kind of a separate issue that is, is being worked on, but that's not what this process is here to address. They, there are also efforts with a lot of the ARPA money to increase flexibility. And what the state keeps saying is they wanna see that the right services are provided in the right time and right amount. But what's really important is that what is right it, you know, that's a really subjective word, is determined by the client. 
So you might have two clients with very similar profiles and one client might want a lot of support and another one might not, and that's okay. Um, there's, you know, part of, you know, we throw around the term person centered a lot, and I don't know that people always understand exactly what it's supposed to mean, but person centered, it means that the clients have some say in how they live their lives and that will dictate what support is needed. Now, again, just because something's needed, it may or may not be available, but that's kind of a separate question after the state determines what and how much. Um, so are there any questions before I kind of talk about the new assessment process and what's happening with that? And, and this is, Sue, did you have something? You're on mute. No, I'm just really interested in this. Oh, good. Um, you know, you clearly have a ton of experience, so, so chime in anytime. Um, it's a small group, so I, I'd invite anyone to just chime in if, if you have a question. I do um, want to just point out that Medicaid benefits are supposed to be sufficient in scope to provide the same services statewide. And right, but this is home and community-based services, Kristen, so the, the law is a little bit different. Ah, well, then I'm glad so, I asked because it just, yeah. it burns my yeah. butt because these are the, the uh, benefits that keep you at home. Exactly, exactly. And, and we still don't have a statewideness waiver in these programs, but that, you know, so, so they should be sufficient, but the law is like not totally as, as strong when it's home and community based because it's not a mandatory service, because it's a, it's a waiver service. Um, but that, but Kristen's point is well taken, which is that there is a regulation in Medicaid that services, if the state chooses to offer them, have to be sufficient and amount duration and scope to reasonably achieve the purpose. And the example I give when I talk about this is Medicaid, you know, when, you know, when you take an antibiotic and they say you've got to take it for 14 days or whatever, or it won't work. Um, Medicaid couldn't say, well, we're only going to pay for 10 days of it because that wouldn't be sufficient to achieve the purpose. Um, I think we could argue a lot of the HCBS services, particularly in the DD system, are not sufficient to achieve the purpose, or at least the rates aren't sufficient to achieve the purpose. But that the the case law on that has not been as as solid as we might like. So this new people have been working on this for about six or seven years. Um, and it, 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 unlike the CIS, it's not um, a tool that was bought off the shelf. We actually you took Minnesota's tool as a model and then kind of designed our own. And that's good and bad. The, the good is we got to make it exactly what we wanted. The bad is it's been very hard for the state to automate it. And that's why there's been so many changes, uh, so many delays is because they keep running into trouble trying to automate things. But when we talk about an assessment, you know, we want to talk about what, what is an assessment, what, who cares, who's involved, and why is there a new one? So when we talk to clients about this, you know, particularly, and again, I think this happens more outside of the DD system, but they always say, you know, the, the standard that you're measured against is, you know, what we call a nursing home level of care. And that scares people because people say, I don't want to go to a nursing home. And so we, we always want to make sure that everyone understands that that's a legal term that has to be used. It doesn't, and, and again, in IDD, sometimes they'll say an ICF level of care, and no one even knows what an ICF is anymore. Um, but or they might in Pueblo, because you actually have Pueblo. So the people might actually know it there, but most people don't even know what an intermediate care facility is. But people say, generally, I don't want to go to a nursing home. And so it's important to make sure people understand you don't have to, um, no one can make you. This is just a term that's used to provide services in the community. And, in, and also it'll determine what services will be helpful and how much you get. And, you know, again, unfortunately that's just the language. People need to know, you know, when I try and explain it at a really high level, I say, these services, if you need help from a human often than not, you're probably going to be eligible. So that, and again, that could be physical help. It could be 
cognitive help. It could be psychological help. It's basically needing help from a human. Um, and it doesn't even have to be every day. Some people might need it once or twice a week. Uh, some people might even need it once or twice a month. That's okay. It's just usually, you know, if it's very, very rare, you're probably not going to be eligible. But if you need regular help, um, you will be eligible. Um, so the case management agencies will complete the assessment. We'll talk in a little bit about what that means because right now people know about them as a community center board or a single entry point. And that's gonna change a little bit as we move into this, the, these changes. By 2024, it's just gonna be case management agencies. But the case manager role is not gonna change. So the case manager there is there to determine needs and identify the next steps. And we try and warn people that the presence of a case manager can be really uncomfortable, especially if you're not used to it. And that doesn't mean that case managers are bad. It just means that they're asking super personal questions and that makes people feel uncomfortable. I think sometimes with family members, it makes them feel defensive um, and, and it's just an uncomfortable dynamic. So in, in this work, we're also trying to reach out to people to say, just know that it's gonna be uncomfortable. There isn't really much you can do to make it like totally comfortable, but preparing and understanding what's gonna be asked and maybe thinking about it ahead of time can really help um, and can help you think about it and get through it, especially through folks that might take a little bit of time to process information. So we, we always- Wait, ahead. Blake used to say, just poop in your pants and look confused. Um, so in terms of who can attend the assessment, um, people can choose who they want to have to be involved. And we're asking people to say ahead of time, to think about that ahead of time of who they want. While some people may choose to not have anyone with them, particularly if they're new at this, we think it's always good to have someone there um, if, if possible. If, if someone needs help with communicating, that's even more important. Um, that might be, again, a translator, you know, and that might be translation for language, it might be sign language, or it might be someone whose speech is really hard to understand, and they need someone that really knows them to be able to answer the questions. Um, people really? should, yes. We should say this, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we should say uh, that it's important, especially for someone who has never done it, to have an advocate if they choose to. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I th I think that's, that's right because the advocate's gonna understand the questions. And I think in addition to just having an advocate be there, the advocate should really be going over this ahead of time and explaining what they're gonna be asked and why, 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 why they need to answer all the questions, um, why they need to be honest. I think people often, you know, it's not really lying, I mean, it's, Kind of lying, but people often want to feel like they want to look good and they put their best foot forward. So they might maybe exaggerate their abilities a little bit um, or be afraid or, or, or be reluctant to talk about what they can't do or what they're struggling with because people are often afraid that they're going to be, you know, I think the big fear is someone's like, well, I'm, they're going to put me in a nursing home. And we have to reassure people that there's no they that can put you in a nursing home. Kristen, did you want to pipe in? All right, I saw your hand raise, that's why I asked. So, um, so they're gonna ask about your support needs um, in all different ways, uh, talking about activities of daily living. And it gets, this gets a lot more detailed than the current um, ULTC 100.2. So like, in, instead of just asking about bathing, it'll talk about bathing your upper body, bathing your lower body, you know, is it a bed bath? Is it a shower? Is it, you know, a mix? It gets into a lot more detail and the reason for more detail is not really about eligibility. It's more about eventually this is going to get transferred into a, an algorithm that will help determine um, how much someone gets. So um, they'll also, the other thing that's new is that when they talk about memory and cognition, unlike the current processes, they're going to spend some time on executive function, like planning, problem solving, organizing 
things that our current tools don't capture, but are really huge in terms of someone's ability to get through their day and really huge in terms of someone's support needs. So, um, so again, it's really important to help people try and you know, be as open as possible and reassure people that being honest isn't gonna cause a problem for them. Like, like there's, a, people always think that there's some entity that can come like plop them out of their house and put them in an institution. And there just isn't, I mean, only a court, you know, you'd have to get a court order to do that. And that's not gonna happen easily. Um, they'll also ask people about their goals um, and if they need routines to be in a certain way. Now they say they're going to pass that on to, to staff when, once it gets into services. I, to be honest, I don't know how much I trust that how much that's going to translate. I, I would be thrilled if it did, but I've never seen anything translate that easily. Um, so I don't want to let people know that I don't want people to think that just because they say this, that they're not going to then have to tell a service provider, you know, a similar thing. But I think it is good. One of the things they're going to do is to have a story process, um, which is optional, but it's something that you can tell people before they come in your house if you want them to know that. So for someone with a significant speech disability might say, you have to contact me by email, not phone. All, or text, you know, you can contact me by text or email, but please don't call me because you're not going to be able to understand me because you don't know me super well um, or, you know, whatever. They, they also ask about quote unquote natural supports. And the reason I have that in quotes is that often I think the state sometimes looks at that as, well, if a family member is doing it for free, we don't have to pay for it. And sometimes the family member is doing it, but it's a really unhealthy dynamic and they shouldn't be doing it, or it, you know, whether it's that the parents are too old and they're not doing it safely versus a spouse is doing it and they're getting so resentful they're on the verge of divorce. So it's important that when people talk about that, that they also say what is and is not working. Um, a lot of times family members don't know that they can be paid for providing services and not everyone wants or should have a family member getting paid. But the reason it's important to know is that for a lot of family members, if they're trying to provide services and work full time, because the family member still needs an income, that often it really is going to lead to bad consequences and not a good outcome because they're just going to be exhausted and they're going to either get resentful or drop someone or whatever. So we want to make sure that people understand that family members, that really the person with a disability should be leading the choice if they want to have a family member doing the care, but then they can be paid so they're not trying to juggle both work and doing the caregiving. Um, and then the other thing with, with these quote unquote natural supports is a, a true natural support should be reciprocal. So it shouldn't mean, so like for example, if someone is in a church group and they, you know, a, an example of a natural support might be that while they're in the church group, you know, that they have friends in the church group and each of those people has a job and the person with a disability might have the job to arrive early and be the greeter. Someone else might give that person a ride, but it shouldn't be that, oh, because you're in a church group with someone, you're now expected to provide transportation um, while the person with a disability doesn't have any kind of job. That's, that's not a natural support. That's and that those kind of situations, again, just generally lead to resentment and more exclusion. Um, um, I already talked about the, the story thing, and that is optional. If some, some clients, when we were doing the testing, said that they wanted to be able to have one place where they could, quote unquote, tell their story um, or, you know, identify maybe what accommodations they needed, their communication needs, and not have to repeat it every time there's a new case manager. So that's why that's, someone can choose to leave that blank if they want. Um, so, what, so the first part, just like it is now, is, is the, is the uh, eligibility determination. And then it'll go on to a support plan. And then, you know, there's still the, going to be the mandatory check-in every quarter that we have now. Um, now the new training that we've previewed has some interesting stuff in there like saying, and, and we've asked the state, do you really mean this? Because if you don't, don't train on it. 
Um, so for example, it says the client can decide where the assessment is. Um, if, if that's going to be true, great, but if it has to be in the home, they, you know, we've urged them to make sure that their training says that. I think there's, I think CMS, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services or the feds are going through some changes and I think they might be giving guidance that might be a little um, up and down. So we've been reviewing stuff and making sure, telling the state they need to make sure that they're super clear as they start to train. Um, in this presentation that Mona will send you a copy of, there's the, we have uh, just the waiver charts that have all of the waivers and um, all of the services and, and their definitions. As you know, not all services are on all waivers. Um, so we also wanna make sure people understand what their rights and responsibilities are. And case managers, of course, go over that. Um, both at the applicant stage and at the support plan stage. So, you know, we tell people that, you know, it's not only a right, but a responsibility to be part of the development of your, of your support plan and assist with coordination of services. Um, and again, people can choose who else they want involved. Um, so I'm not gonna read this, but again, it, one of the things that will be nicer about the new system that's going to include all the waivers is you should be able to go through the assessment, then get told, here are the three waivers you're eligible for, here are the two waivers, or you're only eligible for one, but often people are eligible for more. And so that to get a, a clearer perspective of here are the two, here's what, here's how they're the same, here's how they're different, so that people can make an informed choice. Whereas right now, because we have the DD waivers separated from the other waivers, all case managers in the system, there is no case manager in the system rather that would know all of the waivers. So it's generally someone finding out and then wanting to switch waivers rather than being presented at the start. Not that this will eliminate switching waivers, of course, because there are times when someone's needs might change um, and they need to change waivers as a result. Um, some of the rights we want to qualify a little bit, you know, the state will, you'll have to tell, the state will say, you know, well, you have a right to change providers at any time. Well, that's great. That's assuming you can find a provider to change to. So we want to be careful when we're talking to clients to make sure that we're not kind of making promises that can't be kept. Um, and hopefully the workforce issues at some point will get better than they are right now. Um, and um, we'll talk about the conflict of interest thing in a few minutes. Um, people also need to know that they have the right to have supports provided in a way that's accessible to them. So again, that might mean, you know, um, texting with someone instead of talking or having the sign language or Spanish or whatever language interpreter available for their communications. Um, some people need to get anything that they have to sign ahead of time because they can't read and process really quickly. So what, so we're, one of the things that we talk to clients about is trying to get people to think about what is it that they need to make this accessible so that they can then um, ask for that ahead of time. Because obviously you can't have a case manager showing up and at that minute saying, oh, I need an interpreter. That's not gonna work. You've gotta ask for these things ahead of time. And so often we, have, we wanna educate clients about that so that they know what to do. Um, Saying about choosing where you live, um, that's true. You can choose where you live within what you, within the, uh, the limits of what you can afford, which in Colorado is really challenging right now. So that generally is supposed to mean, you know, you can choose if you want to live in a group home or host home, or that, or you can choose if you want to live in uh, like a non-residential setting or a residential setting. Um, most people with and without disabilities right now don't have a whole lot of choice about like where they live because people are pretty much living where they can afford to live. And a lot of people don't have a choice to live alone um, without subsidized housing, just, just for affordability reasons. And again, hopefully some of the policy things that are being put into place will deal with that, but that's not gonna happen immediately. Um, we also like to talk about the difference between a grievance and an appeal um, because people have the right to do both. 
but people often confuse those two things. So the, uh, I always say an appeal is about what you get and a grievance is about how people act. So an appeal happens if someone is denied a service or benefit or request or um, has a reduction, termination or suspension, or if someone applies for something and it's not acted upon with reasonable promptness. Now where this issue comes up a lot is with the counties. Someone you know, applies for home and community-based services, they do the, you know, the assessment with the SEP or the CCB, and then they do the financial with the county, and then five months later, everyone's saying, what's going on? Um, they have 90 days. And so at that point, and, and it's only, the 90 is only for the, if there's a disability determination involved, otherwise it's 45. You can actually file an appeal if, if they don't meet their timeliness. Um, and we often will advise people to do that because that's a way to get attention, to, to get them to do it because they won't have a justification. So do it, the appeal go away. But, but most appeals are based on a denial, reduction, termination of services. Um, appeals are also really important, even if there's, if it's a technical issue, like someone's year ran out and someone, and there's not a new prior authorization, if that if that can't be chased down and fixed quickly, then it's important to file an appeal because that will, by law, keep benefits going. Um, an appeal is a formal process where an independent administrative law judge hears your case. And I'd say probably 90% of the appeals we file never go to court, never, ne they, they get settled beforehand because it, it's usually tech either technical or something that can be worked out. The few that aren't are the ones that are like really what appeals are for, which is like a genuine disagreement about what, you know, is someone eligible for five or eight hours a day? Those are the, those are the ones, or, you know, is um, this level of wheelchair really medically necessary or could the person make do with the one that's a level lower? Those are the ones that we tend to take to court, but most eligibility cases never go to court. It's just a matter of kind of preserving the rights so that nothing stops. Grievances is more about how someone acts. And it's if someone feels they were mistreated by a case manager or supervisor, if there's a pro quality problem and no one will help to resolve them, or if no one will respond at all um, or not respond quickly. Um, an example is this was in, not in the Pueblo area and it was in the, another area. Um, someone said that um, they got a quarterly call of voicemail from their case manager saying, I'm your new case manager, let me know if you need to talk. The person called back and said, yeah, actually, I do need to talk, and it's been three weeks. That would be an example of a grievance. Um, now, when you say, so what happens if you file a grievance? Well, the state collects from these case management agencies what grievances are filed and what the response is. And, and once a grievance is filed, then a letter or someone has to investigate and respond in a certain amount of time. So people say, well, why bother? Doesn't sound like much is gonna happen. Well, the reason to bother is it, it, the agencies that wanna do a good job want this information because they wanna know what's going wrong so that, it, you know, cause it might just be, I mean, one time with, um, I believe this was with Rocky Mountain Human Services, we filed a grievance and they found out that um, they had an, some kind of technical error in a voicemail, someone's voicemail box. And so the person wasn't getting messages that were being left through no fault of their own. If, if no one, if everyone had just said, oh, they, you know, they're horrible, they don't return calls, they would have not known that. So the, the people that, so of course, once they, you know, identified that they fixed it immediately and were able to then reach out to the people who had not gotten a call back um, and apologize and repair that relationship. So or sometimes it might just be a case manager and a client or just a horrible match for each other and you should just change it. So the, the good ones want to know, but also the state needs to know so that if there's constant problems, they can take that into account with contracts and future procurements. So it's, it's really, it, it often it may not, may or may not solve someone's immediate problem today, but it really helps the system work better if people do this. And I just know, even though we don't provide case management or services as a director of an organization, I really depend on someone letting me know if something isn't right, um, because otherwise, and my staff really appreciate that too, because if we don't know, we can't fix it. 
So it, a grievance should, unfortunately, the word has this really negative connotation. And I wish there was a different word because it really is more about a feedback um, loop and it, and, and it shouldn't be seen as a negative. I actually, as an advocate, judge organizations that say they have no grievances much more harshly because what that says is you don't have a system where people are comfortable saying anything because no one's going to run a service organization or a case management organization and have no problems. It just is impossible because, you know, it's people that we're dealing with. So when someone says, yeah, we had, you know, 25 grievances and here's how we resolved them, that makes me feel a lot better to say, oh, good, they're encouraging people to, to speak up if something isn't working and they're addressing that. So, um, so again, we, we also want to let clients know that they should um, give accurate information, um, let case managers know about changes, particularly if they're moving or they've been in a hospital. I don't know that they really have to let someone know if they've gone to the emergency room and you know we're out in two hours, but um, they should definitely, if they've been in the hospital for a while or if they haven't received services that they're supposed to, and the reason we say cooperate with providers and case management agency when appropriate is there might be times when it isn't appropriate. So for example, if someone says it, you know, calls and says it's time to do your annual review and the only time I can do it is in the next hour, that's not appropriate. So we wouldn't want someone to say, oh, okay, I'll leave my job and go do this meeting. They, they need to push back on that. And there are times when providers might ask a client to do something that's inappropriate, like, um, will you sign a blank timesheet? Um, and, you know, or will you, you know, lie to the supervisor and say I was here when I wasn't? Um, and they should not cooperate with that. Julie? Yeah. So you, you, you said, you give an example when you report changes to your case manager, not necessarily to report when you have to stay in the emergency for uh, for two hours because something happened, right? Uh, but they do ask you that question, right? During the... When, during the, the assessment, yeah, they ask if you've been in the emergency room and it's fine to, to say it. And it's, I'm not saying you, should, you can't report it. I'm just saying, I don't know that it's really that necessary. But if someone's, unless it's about your services. So if you, let's just say your personal care worker hasn't shown up and so you're transferring yourself when you're really not safe to do that and you fell and ended up in the ER, you absolutely want to let them know about that. But for example, I'll give a silly example about myself. This is kind of embarrassing, but um, a number of years ago, um, I was wrestling with my cat and he bit my hand and I got a little infection. So I needed to go to like an urgent care, whatever to get a, it was of course on Thanksgiving. So I needed to go and get a antibiotic shot. That's not, that has nothing to do with my disability. It's not something I needed to let a case manager know. I'm just saying like, you might go to the emergency room for something totally unrelated. Um, and you don't, you, but if it's, if it's like I fell because I didn't have help, that's absolutely something you need to let someone know. Um, whether or not that was in your support plan, it might be that someone's disability is changing and maybe they didn't need someone to help them transfer and now they do. Um, either way, that, that those are the things you should let someone know. So thanks for the question because it was a little more nuanced. Although when they ask you, have you been to the hospital in the last six months or the ER, you should answer that inclusive of everything. So any questions before I kind of get into what's changing? And I know I kind of covered some of that as I was talking. Um, yeah. Um, are the direct service providers paid any more than they ever have been? Like right now, you mean? Uh, with, the, with the changes? Yeah, no, okay. Yes, they're paid more, but not because of these changes. They're paid more because of the labor crisis and a number of advocacy actions. So there's now a minimum wage of 15 an hour statewide for all direct service workers. Like they cannot be paid less than that. Um, and of course in Denver, it's more than that because our minimum wage is higher than that anyway. Um, Does that include like housekeeper? Yeah, all direct services. Okay. So. 
because that was that's been uh, an ongoing problem for just years and years that if you yeah. pay someone so little, you're going to run into abuse. And I don't know what the rate rates are in Pueblo, but in Denver, I would never think of hiring someone for only 15 or even 16 an hour, no matter what the task is. I mean, that you just can't pay that little. Um, so. I have um, a question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. And maybe you're going to get to this, but if, if I'm understanding right, there's going to be one universal assessment. Yes. To determine what programs people can be eligible to apply for. Correct. Correct. And will that even include like the, uh, you know, because with the children's extensive support waiver, you know, there's a, there's a CES application that looks to see if the person meets the criteria for interventions, frequency and right. intensity of needed interventions. Would it eliminate the CES application? You know, that's a good question. It was supposed to, but some of the stuff I've seen is leading me to believe that that might come a little later. Um, but the goal is, so, so I don't know that it will when it first launches but the goal is really to not have there be multiple assessments so it, what 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 i imagine it'll come to in the end is you answer certain questions and then it'll take you down like a decision tree of like now here are these other questions that they would ask if you might qualify for ces but probably but they wouldn't ask you if you definitely wouldn't so like a if you're an adult or if you're you know if, if it looks like you're going more on the medical line you know, like if there are no behaviors, for example, you wouldn't ask that you wouldn't. So a lot of this is kind of using like logic in, in this electronic assessment process. But it will definitely replace the CIS, the long-term yeah. care assessment, the ICAP. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And and now the CIS won't get replaced right away. And, I'll, and I will kind of talk about the timeline. So, um, so, so yeah, so like the current assessment, and, and it was actually designed a little bit differently, but then the state kind of changed, the, changed it halfway through the process. But the current assessment only does eligibility, it doesn't do services. Like, like you can use it to do services, but you use it to decide if you're eligible and then you move into what, what services are available and, you, and it doesn't really translate, I mean, it should kind of match, but it doesn't, it, it's kind of clunky. The, and right now, the only, um, only people with an intellectual and developmental disabilities have an algorithm project program, which is like the CIS. Everyone else, it's just, you know, like you're eligible and then it's just kind of this open, you know, again, and that's where it's really unfair in terms of what you get, where if you know what you're doing and what to ask for, you can get your needs totally met. But if you don't, um, you might not be offered options. Um, so this is going to eventually, and again, the algorithm part isn't going to be ready until 2024. And they're going to start doing the assessment in 2020, late, late this year or tw early 2023. But they need to collect like a year's worth of data before they can build the algorithm. So during that year, the CIST will go on with this assessment if that makes sense so like you're not so there's going to be a lag between getting rid of the cis um this this assessment hopefully will identify the state to identify all needs and allocate services and and again when i say it's not going to be like the cis where they're going to say okay you're at level x and therefore you can only pay someone y dollars it'll it'll be and for these specific services it will be more like your range is between X and X dollars, then you can figure out. So it might be, let's just say they say you, you qualify for between you know, 125 and $150 a day of services, then the client can, you know, and their support team can figure out, do I really want that to be like, do I want really good day services and I'll take care of at home or do I work and I don't need anything during the day? So I want to put this all into supports to get to and from work, you know, to get up in the morning. 
you'll be able to figure that out in a better way, I think. This will be longer and more inclusive, which is going to be kind of a pain as you're starting the process, both for case managers and clients, because it'll just take longer. Um, every assessment should include directions about self-direction and employment. And obviously, some people aren't going to want to answer those. So for employment, you know, if someone's 96, they might say, I'm not interested in employment. I don't want to I don't want to talk about that. Um, and they don't have to, but we're going to start talking about it, particularly with working age people, to start raising the expectation because we have the Medicaid buy-in that people do work, um, that, that adult, you know, that's what adults do in our society. Now, some people might, you know, they might have a tolerance of working four hours a week, and some people can work 40 or 50. Um, but we want to start at least raising it. And again, if someone says, I don't want to talk about it, then that's fine. But it's going to be asked everywhere. And same thing with self-direction, for people to know that they have a right to direct services. Um, and, and again, if someone says, I'm not interested in that, that's totally fine. But we want to make sure that it's being offered. Um, I think I talked about this already. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the algorithm in, in a bit about kind of what, what we're focusing on. Um, there's a whole website. And again, I think it's important to remember that the goal and part of why this is taking so long is to make sure that, the, that this doesn't reduce services. So they're gonna have to, like, that's why they need a year of data. They need to take the data we have now, you know, so, okay, I did this assessment. Here's what it looks like. If I plug in this to this algorithm, what's that going to do in terms of someone's services, like compared to what they're getting now? Now, we want to be a little cautious about that because a lot of people on the CIS are underrated because they don't use all of the data. And one of the problems with the CIS is they take data that, like, they get all this data, but then they only use certain sections to calculate the score or the stall level. So we want to make sure that we're not just saying whatever someone's getting now is the right number, but because some people are not getting the right number. But we do want to make sure that this doesn't do what the CIS did in 2006, which is create wide scale reductions. I remember when the CIS came, they were, the state was fond of saying, well, they're winners and losers. Well, that's nice, but if you're one of the losers and you've just had your life blown apart by having your supports taken away, that's not really comforting. Um, so we're very intent on not letting that happen. And that's, that makes it clunkier and longer, but I think that's worth it. Um, and, and, and right, you know, again, is decided by the person and that might change. So I know in the DD system, even if someone is getting paid supports when their parent dies, that often necessitates a change. Even if one parent might still be alive um, because things that families just do you know, that there, you know, so there might be things I know, um, I have an adult child with a disability, and there are things that I just do that I don't get paid for, I don't want to get paid for them. But, but once I'm gone, someone's going to have to get paid for them. And that's more around kind of managing day to day things. It's not physical care or anything like that. Um, and even though my adult child does a great job with the independence, there are just certain things that, you know, that you do as a family member. So those, you know, I know other people where family members might, you know, do the personal care on Sundays so that the workers have a day off, but when they're not available anymore, that has to then become paid. So sometimes what, you know, things change. Um, hopefully as more people focus on employment, some of the need for a lot of day directed activity will reduce. Um, but it may not. Someone might, it actually might be that someone, you know, was in a group program, a group day program, and now that they have a job that they need individualized support. So some people's needs will go up, others will go down. Um, any questions before I kind of talk about the case management changes? And I am going to go back to how the algorithm is going to replace the CIS at the end. Okay. So case management redesign. We've been talking about this also for many, many years. Um, so right now, our system, we have the community center board. If you have an intellectual or developmental disability, we have the single entry point for everyone else. And then for some children in some parts of the state, we have these children's case management agencies that are private. 
Um, I don't know if you actually have that in Pueblo, um, or if that gets used in Pueblo or not. I'm not aware of one in Pueblo, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, and so what we're going to have is a case really? manager. Yeah. Sorry, I, my mind wandered off when you before. What were you asking about if it exists in Pueblo? Uh, Children's Private Case Management Agency. Oh, I don't think we no. have a private one, but we do have quite a few services. Right, so that's different. Yeah. No, but we sometimes have referred to a private one in Springs. The in the Springs? Above, yeah, with counseling. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about, and I and I don't I don't think those are going to exist anymore either. Although, so, yeah, she told me that it yeah there there will be no private ones, and she's just going to retire when they in 2024. Yeah, so with with the new model, and that that was based on a bill passed in. Uh, I want to say 20 either 2020 or 2021, I can't remember now. I think it was 2021, but there have been several versions of this. Um, there'll be 20 different regions and each region will have a case management agency that will serve all individuals regardless of their age, disability or their waiver. Um, again, we hope this is gonna be a good thing. And the, um, the, the, there are two main reasons. One is the conflict-free issue that's been, you know, discussed forever, and you know the conflict is someone arranging services and providing them, and that. Um, and, and and I don't think I think this has been kind of portrayed as people are doing something evil or bad, and I don't think it's that. I think it's that when you are providing when you know someone, you're gonna have a bias towards them, I hope, if you're working with them, hopefully you trust them. So if you're a case manager and you're arranging services and there's five agencies that provide those services, but one of them is run by your friend who's works down the hall from you, it's gonna be a lot easier to refer to that one. And it might be a little more uncomfortable if then the client calls and says, oh, they're, you know, they're not providing good services. In some ways it might be easier. You can walk down the hall and talk to someone, but then if the person who, who is someone who you also eat lunch with every day, who you're friends with says, oh, well, this family is just so difficult to work with. It might be easier to believe your friend than if there's that separation with a different agency. And that doesn't mean that anyone's bad. That's how we all act. I know over the years, people on my staff have wanted us to do different services. And have said, oh, but you know, this is really, really needed the service and we could do a good job. And I always say no, because the minute we're doing services, then we're not an advocate. And it's really the same thing with case management is it's, is it's really hard to do both. And so I think, you know, I know that each region now there's talks about what are we going to be? Are we going to be, you know, each CCB and each setup have to decide what they want to do. And in most areas, the two are talking and deciding who's going to do what. I know in a lot of areas, the case managers that are doing those functions are just going to move over to the single entry point. Um, so I think that um, the transition will be rough. I don't see how it's not going to be. Um, I've been involved in a few transitions already of like single entry points, changing contracts. Um, and the, they're not seamless. The larger the area, I think the more complicated it gets. Um, in the tiny areas, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but the other thing is the state hopefully will be, have better accountability and management. So right now they have, there's one, one group has, has 24 and the other has like 26, but there's like over like 45 different entities that they're trying to manage. This will cut it to 20. And I think that there's 20 and then without having two different structures, they'll be able to do a better job with training support expectations for case managers. Because one of the problems right now is case managers have been given almost no guidance from the state and often inconsistent guidance. Um, and then every time the person at the state changes, like the rules, change, you know, it's, it's almost like, well, now who do we talk to? A lot of the guidance has been in phone calls or in webinars, not really in formal memos. 
And the state's trying to change that and become more professional as this population has grown so that they can give better guidance and say, you know, and have actually professionally done trainings. They're gonna have a whole like case, man. I think they wanna go towards like a certification program, but to have an actual library of trainings for case managers, which I think is totally appropriate and only fair for case managers um, to have that kind of, um, you know, accountability and support and to have, and to be able to say, you know, for, for the people running these agencies to be able to onboard people in the right way, instead of saying, well, this week the rule or the direction was this, um, but who knows what it's going to be next week to have a better system. And I think they can do that better with this kind of accountability and not, and not having so many different ones to be reviewing and managing, but it'll be, it'll be a transition. This is supposed to happen in 2024 also. Um, my understanding is the, and Mona, correct me if I get these dates wrong. My understanding is the request for proposals is gonna come out in 2023, early in 2023. And then there'll be an, a response and then there'll be panels evaluating kind of who's gonna get these contracts in different areas of the state. Is yeah, that true? Yeah, it's actually uh, going to release December 31st, the RFP, and they'll have um, until March, and then it closes on March 1st. Right, and then there'll yeah. be probably several months of making a decision. So there'll be a good six months of transition time, it sounds like. So it sounds like they're probably gonna announce July, like in July of 23 for beginning calendar year 24, is that right? I believe that's correct. Yeah, so that's gonna be, again, I don't, I'm not naive enough to think that goes, goes without challenge, but I think overall, it should be a good move. Um, so any questions on that before I kind of get to the final part about this algorithm thing? Okay. So, um, so, so they say they're calling this the person-centered budget algorithm. And the cynical side of me is like, you can't just put person-centered in front of something and think it's going to be good. Um, and you can't, it has to work. Um, and we're, we're hoping that it will work. So uh, an algorithm is, is just a step-by-step -step process that's programmed into a computer. And we've been hearing a lot about algorithms, like in the news, like the algorithm, like that Facebook uses to send you advertisements. Um, and, but a lot of things happen, this is an algorithm too. So, like I said, it gives each person a range of spending that should meet their needs. So in other states, when, uh, so generally states manage their home and community-based services in one of two ways. One is they have an algorithm or two is they have ma um, corporate outside managed care companies making decisions or, but, or they have both. Um, so they can work well, or they can be a disaster. Um, you know, again, CIS, I think was a disaster. And I keep saying it's kind of up to us to make sure it works well by being involved. So when the states started talking about this idea, I started looking at other states where these transitions have gone really badly and research what happened. There's three consistencies in these states that have made things bad, two of which we had with the CIS. So the first is they've had corporate managed care running things, not local organizations. Um, we, we have actually in our state statute a prohibition against managed care for long-term care, which is I think a good thing. Um, and so we will continue to have local organizations as the case management. Um, the other thing which we've had in the CIS is no transparency, meaning no one knows how these decisions are made or what, you know, you plug stuff in and you need to understand like, why does this result come out? Um, you know, I, I had a CIS case once where someone like went from, you know, one level to, to another or she, she, you know, she asked for a CIS redo because she had developed a major seizure disorder and it came out with no change. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. How can that happen if someone, you know, needs all the supervision now because they're having uncontrolled seizures, whereas before they didn't, 
And I think there are some other problems. Hi, because it doesn't make sense that nothing would change. Consultation from earlier this morning. Okay. Um, how's the internet? So far. So, um, and then um, the final thing is no exception process. Now I know the CIS technically has that new one, but we still kind of feel like it, it doesn't have a real process, um, you know, because it's so difficult to use. So an easy exception process is super important. Um, so um, so we, we've been, you know, we've demanded and we've been promised that we will have the transparency. Now there's none yet because it hasn't been developed yet. And an exception process. The other important thing for an exception process is to understand um, what is needed, uh, what isn't working. So if we get 20 people in one month asking for an exception on you know, supports for employment, then we know that something's wrong in the system that isn't giving people adequate points for that based on their answers or that the question's wrong or something's wrong. And that's one of the benefits of having our own tool is that we will be able to modify it as needed, which is not something we can really do as much with the SIS. Although part of the problem with the SIS is that the state did not use it. Um, like they, they changed how it's supposed to be used. They don't use all of the data from it. So, um, so, so any questions on that? Um, so I know I just talked really fast for like the whole hour at you, um, but Mona is going to get into um, how people can be involved. Yes, thank you, Julie. Yeah, so we feel that people get involved. Um, people who have been impacted or this is um, have lived experiences or people who support people with disabilities are in best position to provide or get involved um, and speak up. And so because um, and so we're inviting everyone to get involved and we have several ways of getting involved. Number one is to join an oversight or advisory committee for a case management agency. Secondly, we have, a, I talked about a steering committee earlier in the presentation and we have three subcommittees out of that. One is for the new assessment tool, which is now called the Colorado Single Assessment or CSA. The other one is for outreach which doesn't meet as frequently, and one is for case management redesign. The CSA and the case management redesign meet on a monthly basis. And so everyone's welcome to join. If you're interested, reach out to me and I will get you all set for that. And then there's the person-centered budget algorithm when the state um, begins to work on that, they'll make announcements. And if that's something that interests you, then um, you'll be, um, you know, reach out to the state and we'll give you ways on how to do that. Uh, we also will have advocates throughout the state that in communities, they will be trained and they will be there to support people in their communities help them understand the assessment process and be at the assessment process and speak up for them. If something goes sideways, they can help them with grievances and appeals. And they will communicate, they will be a mediator between the, our client or member and us. And then we recently um, have the Young Professionals Program. Uh, it's for high school students uh, and the deadline for that um, application is tomorrow. So if anyone is interested, um, has a, a young person who would be interested in getting involved to let me know and I will get you that information as well. <clears throat> and so, um, and that's a cohort of 10 people and it's over, I believe 10 weeks. And so once, they complete it 
and go through the entire 10 weeks program, um, they will receive a small uh, stipend of $500. So, and so those are so, and then there's the John Barry's um, constant contact list, uh, john.r.barry at state.co.us. And he sends out information on a weekly or biweekly basis of upcoming meetings, memos, um, so forth. So if anyone, and if you're still not sure, then please follow us on uh, social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and then decide. Julie, you're in mute. Thank you. So again, I know we just went through a ton of stuff really quickly, but um, do people have any questions or comments or thoughts or concerns? All right, well, thank you so much for taking what is kind of feels like a Monday morning um, to talk to us and um, Mona will be sending you a copy of the presentation as well as a, a quick survey. Um, you're on mute. Uh, oh, just a poll that's right now. We very much appreciate your time. Um, and uh, People can feel, we'll uh, leave this up for a few more minutes in case people um, needed, um, need more time. Um, so um, you have a, a, great, a great day. And again, if you have any you know, questions or comments, um, we can stay on for a few minutes too. I just want to encourage all the people who are in Pueblo to get in touch with me if there are any questions. I think also the Center Toward Self-Reliance would be a good place to um, organize everything. I, they're not here, so I would think they would be involved in this because they do um, some services. So um, just let me know and we'll work through things. Right. Thank you, Kristen. Right. Well, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.